Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. It just, it feels super futuristic, which I think is part of what I like about it. You talk about Apple design and you sound like the most ridiculous fanboy ever, but like this is really good. Like it's, it's the precise number of magnets. And when you see those like little magnet papers on it and it's like, oh, there's like two tiny little magnets right here. And it's like somebody had to go in and go, we need this much more magnetic force. We need like just one more little magnet right there and one more little magnet right there. And now it's perfect. And you know, somebody spent the time to figure out like if you flip it and shake it and do whatever with it, it's not going anywhere. But when you want it to come off, pop, it's right off. Welcome back to another episode of iPad Pros. I'm excited to bring you the first of two episodes covering the Magic Keyboard. This week, we are joined by Ian Fuchs of The Cult of Mac, and next week is an episode I recorded with Chris Lawley of The Untitled Site. The Magic Keyboard is the reason I ultimately upgraded from my second generation iPad Pro to the fourth generation. It is an accessory that truly does change the form factor of the iPad, and is the kind of change we got back with the introduction of the Apple Pencil and the original Smart Keyboard. The inclusion of the trackpad and the ease of taking the iPad on and off the keyboard is remarkable. The iPad is even more so a modular computer now than ever before, thanks to the Magic Keyboard. And I'll have some more thoughts in future episodes about Face ID iPads, which has also been a remarkable change. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can head over to patreon.com slash iPad Pros. Every dollar is of huge help and is greatly appreciated. Thank you if you currently or have in the past supported me on patreon.com slash iPad Pros. You can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Every review is very helpful and really helps the podcast reach a wider audience as every review helps promote the show more and more in search. So thank you if you've left a review. And if you haven't, head over to Apple Podcasts to leave one right now. With that, here's my interview with Ian. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Ian. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. Can you first introduce yourself and just generally how you use the iPad? Uh, I'm Ian Fuchs. I do video for cult of mac i also started at cult of mac as a kind of apps guy so that was my original racket was doing like app reviews and stuff like that and it slowly shifted into doing video stuff a lot of the stuff that i've talked about written about discussed on cult of mac are ipad related things whether it's apps or features of ios or ipad os just general like changes to ipad os and functionality things like the addition of the trackpad things like or trackpad support things like the new uh, multitasking gestures and stuff like that in in the system so it's just one of those like i got into the ipad with the first generation and i've kind of just followed along and so when i've had the opportunity to do tech journalism type stuff or video stuff it's one of those products that's always you know in the arsenal to to look at talk about think about yeah for sure i remember when the original ipad came out i was always wanted to do an apple podcast but it felt like the space was just so busy already so when 2010 came out around i launched ipad possibilities and it was a brand new kind of place to you know talk about apple stuff and ipad it's always been an interest of mine as well Sure. So you start with iPad 1 and you've kind of upgraded every couple of years or did it drift off and then it came back with the iPad Pro being a more serious product you could actually get work done with? Let's see, the, the original iPad, when I will say that I got that, I was actually, the job I had at the time was at, at my alma mater and I was working in the like media department, video department, radio department, whatever. So as a joke to my boss, I was like, we should get iPads. And it was like right after the day they were announced. And he was kind of a, a techie nerd like I, I am. And he was like, actually, that's a really good idea. Let's, let's make a case for it. What can we do with the iPad? I said, well, you know, we, we run all of the radio station on Macs. I think there's probably a way to do like remote desktop from the iPad to the Mac that's down on the radio station. So when we do live events, we could actually trigger like sound effects and stuff like that from the iPad, you know, remotely. And he was like, perfect. That's the case we needed. Ordered two of them for the department. And that, that kind of started the whole thing. So it was, for me, it was always this, like, what kind of weird thing can I do? A couple of years later, I got the, I guess it would be the third generation, the, the new iPad when that was the new iPad, the one that was what retina, but still 30 pin and overheated like crazy and had terrible battery life. Yeah. I remember playing around with that one. Some friends had it and yeah, that one was a hot mess. I got that. And I remember feeling super burned six months later when the lightning version of it came out. And then somewhere in that time, my wife got the same one and then returned it and then ended up getting an iPad mini 
first gen sometime after that. So it was like kind of this, even at that point, it was like starting to experiment with different sizes of iPads for different things. Yeah. And so like I used the bigger iPad, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, whether it was watching videos, taking notes in meetings, tried a plethora of cases and docks and keyboards and stuff for that. And then I would use hers just for like reading email or reading books. It was a big thing was like reading books on it or reading magazines and stuff like that. Back in the days, a newsstand. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, I got an iPad Air 2. Fast forward a couple more years, uh, different job. I got the 9.7 inch iPad Pro, which started to open the door to like more power on stuff. Then I got and tested, or I, I bought the 10.5 inch iPad Pro in September after the Apple event, thinking, okay, there's no new iPads this year in 2018. Sure. And and if you know what happens in 2018, we do. You know, yeah. A few a few more than 14 days later, you know, outside of my return window, <laughs> Apple introduces these two kick-ass iPads, the 11 and 12.9, and I just I was so furious because I was certain this 10.5 was going to get me through for another year or two. So I was like, all right, great, I bought it. You know, on a two-year payment plan through Verizon, and these new ones come out, and I was like, oh, oh. crap! I jumped the gun thinking I had waited long enough and i just had to wait a little longer yeah um so i was i was fortunate enough that through doing video at cult of mac i was able to get a 12.9 to review and that was like okay this really changes things for me so i ended up getting one for myself of the 2018 with cellular with the keyboard k or the keyboard folio with the apple pencil and you know now the magic keyboard awesome yeah i still have my 10.5 i really do like that's like my favorite as far as home button ipads go that was like the pinnacle of design the really thin bezels on the side it just was a great device yeah but yeah to 14 days before the 11 inch not as great <laughs> had i known that was coming around the corner like legit coming in 2018 I wouldn't have done it. And, and part of it too was we, we had a family trip and I was like, I need a new iPad for this family trip because we're going to drive. We we're driving to Florida. And so I wanted something that I could let my daughter watch, you know, like movies or whatever. I gave her the 10.5 so that she could watch, but having the 11 would have been so much cooler because ultimately yeah. they're like basically the same footprint, just a little more screen yeah and way cooler design so as far as keyboards go did you ever get that keyboard docket back in 2010 or what was your you had some cases back with the third gen or when did you start using keyboards with your ipad i don't think i ever paired a keyboard with that original ipad which i i do still have an original ipad it's not the original ipad that i had i was in line at an apple store and a guy was going to recycle one and I was like, are you literally just going to give that away? And he's like, yeah, you want it? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> so he like literally just handed it to me in line waiting to pick up a phone at the Apple store, you know, back when you could go to the Apple store. Sure. So yeah, I don't think the first one I ever used a keyboard with. I did have some different keyboards for the new iPad. I, I did a, a combination of keyboard cases. Uh, Logitech made one that was like a fabric-y covered. Like it actually really reminds me, like looking back on it, it reminds me a lot of the smart keyboard folio and how it was designed where it was like a little magnet thing that flipped down but it was this big hefty case and then kind of a, a rubbery coated keys on the actual keyboard which it worked fine i used it some but there wasn't a lot of options you know back in the early days so most of the keyboards that i would use were just bluetooth keyboards you know whatever i had lying yeah. around for different bluetooth keyboards they never felt practical to me right like it wasn't until apple started making well i guess you know, Zag started making before Apple started making like the keyboard cases where it was like the whole thing folded in on itself and they were decent keyboards. Like that was when it started to kind of sh shift for me a little bit where it's like, okay, having a keyboard isn't so bad. It's kind of a good experience. You know, it's comfortable to type on hindsight is 2020. Like now I look back and I'm like, man, I could have used for more screen space. But at the <laughs> time I was like, no, 9.7 is all I need. Like I don't need a bigger screen than that. Like I dabbled in the 11 inch air forever ago. So like, the small screen thing, I kept going smaller and smaller. And I was like, this is perfect. All I need to do is be able to type. So like I said, I tried those, uh, like I said, a multitude of different uh, Bluetooth keyboards from just about every brand. Um, I've tried Bridge. I've tried Logitech. I've tried Canix or Canix. Obviously, Apple's different ones. Uh, my, my personal favorite Bluetooth keyboard is actually a, uh, I think it's Anchor makes it. And it's like a travel, like it's designed to be like a little travel keyboard that you would use I guess with a tablet or maybe yeah. it's an external keyboard for your, your MacBook. And I probably have, you know, half a million words written on that and different reviews and stuff that it was just always my go-to. And I would use the like floppy 
cover of my iPad 3 and, you know, pop, prop it up in stand mode and just have my little Bluetooth keyboard. But for me, like after I tried the smart keyboard on the 10.5, number one rule is it all has to be self-contained. I can't have separate pieces because I don't want to like assemble a desk when I take my iPad somewhere to do work. Right. Yeah. You don't want a portable desktop computer. You want a basically a laptop. Right. Exactly. Like if I'm, if I'm going to be using it in that kind of context, like with the exception of like maybe the Apple Pencil, which we can get to later. Yeah. Um, like that's the only accessory that I'm okay like not having attached to the iPad. Right. So for the work you do at Cult and Mac, how much of it are you able to do on the iPad? Theoretically, I could do 100% of it on the iPad. Some some of it's <laughs> a pain. Some of it's a pain. Yeah. What, how do you determine what the right tool for the job is with what you're doing there? Uh, the, the big thing for me is if I'm going to spend more than you know 10 or 15 minutes typing something, I almost always will grab the iPad. Uh, the only exception to that has been in the past, I guess, if I'm doing any kind of like code type stuff. Uh, so my, my regular day job is I'm a, a systems admin at a college. So a lot of that involves you know dealing with like command line stuff, occasionally some web programming stuff. And so a lot of that stuff. I also go back to my Mac for, uh, and right now I'm going to my Mac for video editing stuff. But a lot of that is because I haven't had what I feel like is the right combination of tools and convenience and speed to do it on iOS. I have not had a chance to try using like LumaFusion now with the Magic Keyboard to see how that feels. Yeah. But I am definitely curious to see what that's like on the iPad because I think if that happens, it might be enough to push me to retire or reduce the amount of use that I'm using one of my Macs for, and I have a couple. Right. And have you tried using screens with the iPad to see if that is a good like Mac as an application approach for some of the things you do? I haven't. Uh, and the big reason for me, so maybe you know, understanding my, my Mac life is <laughs> is part of the context. So my my personal laptop that I use for like all my Cultimac stuff, all of like my writing, photo editing, anything like that, is the 2015 12-inch MacBook 1. Okay. Yeah. I admired that one from afar. That that no one should have bought and I should not have bought, but I bought because I don't know, it was gold and it was a good deal on eBay when I bought it used and I was coming from a 2008-2009 MacBook Pro 13-inch with a cracked screen. Okay. So I was like, I need something. I don't want to spend a lot of money. I didn't know what else to get. And I thought like, this is going to be the future, right? I was like, Apple's going to make some changes. You know, USB-C is going to be so universal and so ubiquitous in a couple of years. It's going to be the perfect choice. And, you know, it's, you know, five years later, five and a half years later, and we're all still like, mm, is USB-C the future? <laughs> I, sh- I sure hope so. <laughs> Me too. And then my, outside of that, I have an old iMac that sits on a desk in our basement, but trying to do anything through screens to that computer would be so slow and so sad feeling yeah. that like it, it feels like all... I'm wasting this, the speed and power of the iPad on a slow Mac. Cause even using the Mac just directly would be kind of inconvenient. Cause it's got a spinning hard um, drive and it's spinning, spinning hard drive, non retina screen. Yeah. I don't think beach balls get portrayed in screens. Um, I mean, I think when I've used VNC apps and there's beach balling happening, you just don't know it's happening. <laughs> right. See, I don't know. It's, it's one of those, like I'm, I'm kind of stuck bouncing back and forth between devices, which for the most part, isn't a big deal. I have the devices, the devices all kind of have a purpose or can have a purpose. They have a place in my life and I have space for them for now. So it's not a big deal for me to kind of bounce around devices. But, but, you know, to your, I guess, original question, you know, backing up a little bit, like, when do I grab the iPad? I grab the iPad whenever I can. Like if whatever the task I'm about to do is something I can do on the iPad, I'll grab it and do it on there. So if I'm like just checking emails or responding to emails, I'll grab an iPad. If I'm writing scripts for videos or a post for Cult of Mac, I'll grab the iPad. If I'm just browsing the web, I'll grab the iPad. A lot of, I've, I've actually shifted most of my photo editing to the iPad, either in Lightroom or a Pixelmator. Yeah. So I've, I've shifted a lot of that stuff there. Oh, the other big thing I always grab an iPad for that I think that everybody should grab an iPad for is for using in the kitchen for cooking. Oh, yeah. Like if, if you cook at all, like the iPad is the device to use to like pull up recipes and like I use Paprika as like a recipe manager, which then strips out all like the backstory on recipes, which I love. And it makes it really easy. Like on the iPad, you pull up any recipe and you get like a two column view, well, technically a three column view, uh, but a column for ingredients and a column for the actual directions. So you just, I just take that and either I'll put the iPad just sitting you know, on the, the counter or I have a little stand in the kitchen that I can 
set it off to the side. Yeah, I was going to ask, are you going to put it in the uh, the smart keyboard folio with the fabric or a stand? or? So th- with the 10.5, I would always just flip the keyboard around the back and I would prop it up on a stand. Yeah. Because it was out of the way and the stand was secure enough that it wouldn't topple over. Now with the Magic Keyboard, uh, I'm actually pulling it out of the stand and I'll set it or out of the keyboard case and I'll set it in the stand and then like the keyboard case stays out of the kitchen. Yeah, because we'll talk about it a little bit. Magic Keyboard, no fabric cover and I would not trust that (laughs) in a cooking environment. Yeah. Um, But yeah, we'll dive into Magic Keyboard. That's going to be kind of the main focus of this episode. But before we get to that, anything else regarding the iPad that you want to mention or are we able to move on? The, the, The big thing for me that I'll say just in general, very little of what I use the iPad for requires the iPad that I'm using. Like most of what I'm doing, I could do on that first gen iPad mini. So <laughs> like, like I, I think that that becomes like one of the, like the really cool things about the iPad, but also kind of one of the sad things about the iPad. It's like really cool because you can get an iPad and use it for like five years. Oh, totally. As long as your use cases fit within like kind of that entry level iPad stuff. And you can... You wouldn't have the nice Magic Keyboard set up with trackpad, but if you're okay sure. doing right. the construction like, kit, you can get a Magic Trackpad 2 and... Yeah. Exactly. Get a Magic Trackpad 2 and a Bluetooth keyboard or just a Bluetooth keyboard in your finger. Like, sure. You don't have to have all these different things, but like for writing and emails and browsing the web, like you don't need a, a fancy iPad to do it. But at the same time, like that's kind of the sad part about the iPad is that like, I feel like those really like push the limits edge cases... You know, whether it's programming, video editing, photo editing, uh, making apps for people who are doing Xcode stuff, like the iPad is like powerful enough, but the software is just not quite there or the learning curve is just really steep. Like I've, tr- I've done video editing on the iPad and like I can do it, but it takes twice as long. And so I just go to my Mac because I'm faster on the Mac. And like, ultimately for me, I go to whatever tool is most efficient. Yeah. So it's like one of those, if there was Final Cut and it worked exactly the same on iPad as it does on Mac, I'd be on iPad 100%. Yeah, and for me, my biggest thing I do is podcasting, and Ferrite feels like the best application ever written for audio editing and uh, in, in regards to podcast editing. Uh, and Logic would just be confusing and way too much for sure. what I need. But at the same time, you're also not recording into the iPad, right? No, I'm using a Zoom H4 external recorder. I am in front exactly. of my iPad, but yeah, I am using the Zoom to... Exactly, and, like, and that's one of those weird things. It's like, okay, it's so close. Like I know, I know that it's there. The power is inside of this thing. Like just make it so the audio can go different places at the same time, or you can like map stuff. Totally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, every year it gets better and better. So uh, more and more yeah. of these external hardware things we won't need as much. So with cursor support, this was kind of it felt like a it was a big thing to be added just like as a point update for full out cursor support where the developers can customize how they treat it in different ways. Has this changed the way you use the iPad in any way? So I guess we'll go to like what iOS, iPad OS 13 was when they initially had it as the accessibility feature, right? Right. And that felt more mouse driven and trackpads didn't even work for it. Yeah. Like, and I remember trying that. I remember being in, in Slack with the other Colton Mac writers and we were all going back and forth and I was like, okay, this is the mouse I have. Like it has these buttons. What can I do? What can't I do? And trying to figure out like how to make it work. And it, it just felt so fiddly, right? It was like, got to go in and pair my mouse and program my buttons and then like that mouse just has to become my iPad mouse. Cause if I want to use it also on my Mac, like I got to like unpair it and repair it somewhere else. And it, it just was, it was very frustrating. Yeah. So I ended up just, I, I basically said, you know what? Never mind. I don't need this. Put the mouse away. And I actually at that point got the Apple pencil too. Okay. Cause my thinking was, well, if the mouse wasn't the right device for me to do, you know, this kind of navigate the UI, but I want something other than poking at the screen with my finger, maybe I'll try the pencil. And now I, that didn't catch either. <laughs> so I just <laughs> went back to, went back to smart keyboard or smart keyboard folio and, you know, jamming my finger into the screen whenever I could. Then they introduced trackpad support. I tried it right away with the magic trackpad too. I remember being absolutely blown away that it existed, that feature worked. And I was like, I cannot wait for this to be built into a case. Right. Like yeah. Cause you don't want to do the construction kit every time. E- exactly. I, I don't want to carry multiple things because I, and granted, yeah, right now I'm not going anywhere. Right. It's just like, whether I'm working at the kitchen table or the desk in the basement or the desk in the office or outside on the deck. Like, but I don't want to have to carry multiple things. Like I'm already carrying like a coffee or a water and my iPad and probably my phone and my AirPods and you know, whatever handful of stuff that I have. Yeah. I don't need to be carrying also a giant slab of glass with me that like just asking to be broken that I also use with my Mac in the basement. Right. And so I was like, this is awesome. 
when this comes into a case, this will be a game changer. And so as soon as I got the, the magic keyboard, I was like, yep, called it. Yeah. And, uh, thankfully they did announce both the trackpad support and the magic keyboard, I think on the same day, right? I think it was the same day or within a day. I, you know, time is a time is time is a blur right now. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> uh, here's this trackpad support and the magic keyboard's coming and trackpad sports coming out earlier so you can play with it right at least. trackpad supports out today in a beta and also this product is coming in may right yes so what they originally said was the magic keyboard wouldn't be out till yeah till sometime in may and we got it and, uh, late april instead exactly so yeah I, I remember thinking like this is awesome like i just can't wait for this to, to be here and then like seeing the mocks of the magic keyboard i was like this is super interesting like i can't wait to try it and and for the most part, like, has it dramatically changed my ability to do things on the iPad? Not really. But the fluidity that I can move from keyboard to trackpad is, you know, you, you can't beat that going keyboard to screen or all screen because on right. the screen, you're just generally typing slower. So just everything is a little bit slower and bouncing between keyboard and screen always felt a little weird. Now, I do still find myself doing that, especially for things that are in the dock. Like if I'm typing something, I'm like, oh, quick, I need to switch over to notes from mail or whatever. I'll just reach up and, and poke the notes icon and open notes. Yeah. But having the option is is amazing. And I've it's actually further pushed me to poking the screen of my Mac with my fingers. <laughs> yeah, cause, because, oh, I got a trackpad on both places. So obviously it should work there too. It's just this this instant mode shift where I can bounce from like, like I have my iPad Pro here in front of me. I have my Mac here in front of me and like, looking at the two of them they look super similar like i could totally see like typing something and going oh yeah i just need to pause that reach up jab the screen on my mac and realize oh yeah this is the wrong piece of glass yeah so with cult of mac i'd imagine cms's are something you have to interface with and does having a trackpad with hover states help in any way there we use wordpress for ours and i actually some of my freelance work that i do is also on wordpress so i've gotten used to the nuance of using a cms on an iPad as it is. I don't know that it's, again, I don't know it's made a huge difference, but some of that could just be the fact that, you know, mentally I've already adapted to it. So I'm not really like, I guess I don't notice. Yeah. Which I, in itself is probably a good thing. Like, I don't feel like anything got worse. That's for sure. Right. So if things got better, they got better in ways that felt natural and felt right. Uh, and again, bouncing between laptop and iPad, like if on the iPad, they feel more like the laptop, I'm not going to notice because in that context, I'm using the iPad like a laptop. Gotcha. No, did you customize any of the settings to make the track fed feel better for how you like to work? Okay. So I've, I've definitely increased tracking speed, uh, which that sounds about right. Cause I do that on my Macs as well. Uh, and then I've also turned on the tap to click because apparently I'm a tap to click wizard. I don't. Yeah. It's weird on iPad. On the Mac, I don't like it as much when I at, le- at least did use a Mac back in the day with the older ones but um on ipad it does feel nice tap to click for some things like some things i will physically click then others are like oh that's a tap to click it's 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 like i don't know what goes in my head but some things are like oh let me just tap here i think it's i think it's one of those like especially if i'm doing something where i'm already clicking and then you want like a second click you gotta kind of just tap i don't know i don't know if that works on i don't know if that works on the ipad i know on the mac you can do that where like you're selecting something and then you tap again and just like the tap registers as the click um i i I turned it on, I think probably because it was on on my Mac and I went to do it once on the iPad and it didn't work and I got mad. I was yeah. like, you're on now. And then I moved on. With tracking speed, I feel increasing that really helps the side screen gestures work better. Yes. Yes. For sure. Like pulling out uh, the slide over. Yeah. yeah. And then the dock. And uh, I don't use the uh, top one as much to get to my notification center. I think I use that in my initial trackpad support video and then i haven't used it again since yeah it's a weird thing like it just i mean you pull up the lock screen look at notifications i don't know it's just, it just seems an odd one i don't know it's great that you can get to it but i think that that is another thing you know even though i have the trackpad support like if i'm going to pull down notification center i'm always almost always going to pick my hand up and swipe down from the top i don't know why yeah sometimes i'll i'll more often than pull the whole thing down is i'll look i'll just pull it like three like a quarter of way down, just look at the most recent one, then pull it back up. Yeah. See, I don't know. I, and maybe that's part of it is I'm just like, okay, what was that last thing that I missed something? Yeah. So I definitely notification center. I definitely still do it with my hand. Yeah. And I'm finding slide over works better with trackpad than trying to do with my finger. I do more accidental stuff with my finger trying to get slide over to work than with just the trackpad. Yeah. The, the only issue with slide over that I have is I don't, I don't love the dismiss it by going across the app. Something about that feels weird. I don't know. Okay. 
Yeah, I do like that you can dismiss slide over apps that are on the left side of your screen just by going over to the right and just like, boom, it's gone. Yeah. I don't know. I know the first time I tried it with the trackpad, I kept trying to like flick it up like... um I mean, like, like when you swipe up on the home indicator, you know, on any other app or swipe up from the bottom on any other app, like on an iPhone, I'm like, all right, just flick it up off the screen. And then I go back to my home screen and I kept trying to do that. And it kept fanning uh, out into the multitask. Yep. yep. And I was like, what is going on? And I'm like, do I click and drag it off the edge of the screen? No, I don't do that. Like, cause the old behavior with accessibility was you would click and drag it off the screen. It is the most hard thing to get. It was right. It was impossible. Yeah, yes, it, it was, was impossible. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I don't know. It was one of those like something about like pushing to the right of the screen and having the thing left of me go past me just doesn't feel quite right. So I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, and I, I even said this in my, my review with the Magic Keyboard. You can definitely tell all of this was built on top of a system that was already very established. And they tried to take the things that already existed and replicate them in a trackpad manner so it's kind of a bolt-on thing all right it's like we've attached a sidecar to oh can't use sidecar because that's something else um <laughs> we've, we've, we've we put a backpack on an ipad and now the backpack does like some other cool stuff i'm like all right that's that's great but like you could have just you could just change multitasking <laughs> and i know everybody keeps asking for it so right i might as well too right yeah so uh trackpad support in applications have any of the apps that you use on a regular basis added kind of custom support and would have what's impressed you the most so far? Obviously, all of Apple's apps now have it, which like I obviously you expect that you expect Apple to have it built into theirs. And I I like how fluid it feels. I like how easy it is to just like mail, for example, to just swipe stuff off the you know archive stuff, just boom 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 down through a list. Yeah, it's funny with the mail. My first time trying to delete something was clicking and dragging because that's how it used to be with the sister touch it's like oh you mm-hmm. just swipe that's great right. and and i think i think the fact that apple put all of the trackpad stuff into their own apps they did a really good job of putting the trackpads up into their own apps and making it feel like really fluid and really you know kind of coherent uh and and logical right like whatever yeah. feels like what you would do here is what you do there i think that makes apps that don't have those features feel super broken oh totally and it shows you know tweetbot was was one that that comes to mind like i always do the uh was it swipe left swipe from right to left yeah to show the threat on to, to show the threat exactly and like i don't know how to do that with the trackpad i don't think you can get into a thread with the trackpad you have okay. to touch the screen Perfect. it's then, very infuriating that that's then, not there then i'm not insane so yeah i literally have to reach up yeah um, or it, again also a, a tweetbot thing like when you open up a image or an attachment or whatever that's in a tweet and it loads you can't dismiss it with the trackpad like you can't just like flick it away no you have to hit like command period to C- command, command like, period escape. or reach up and touch it exactly yeah. yep and, and actually i just learned the command period thing like a week ago yeah <laughs> i was like oh cool that that's a feature that i didn't know that i needed to know and um, spark is another one that oh they're not doing anything yet and it's just very obvious especially with like text that doesn't change into the proper text um, little line thing to work with text as easily. Sure. Like I, I guess I don't. I don't use Spark. Like my alternate mail app is Outlook because it's what I use for work. Yeah. Um. And I just I noticed yesterday I think that it's actually updated now to support trackpad stuff and like the whatever blob mode where the cursor becomes a blob around yeah. buttons. I, nice. don't, I don't know what else to call it right now. Right. So <laughs> the magnetic <laughs> mode I think is yeah. what Apple likes to call it or something. Like that works. But then, like, I can't two fingers swipe to dismiss or to archive an email, so I still have to like click and drag. So, like, it's like halfway there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting as apps update to support this because they can do a lot with it. Yeah, and and from from my understanding, a lot of it is is pretty intuitive, pretty natural for a developer to add, and it's not terribly terribly hard. Again, this is just like what I'm seeing on Twitter from other people. But I am surprised I'm not seeing more apps call it out in their update notes either. Right. Like Outlook probably didn't even have update notes on it. They probably just added right. it. Right. It was like, oh, bug fixes and improvements. And then like one day it, some of that stuff worked. And I was like, okay, great. It's like, I, I want to know like when Lightroom gets updated. I want to know when LumaFusion gets updated so that I know that these apps are now updated to support these new features. Because at that point, I'll start playing more seriously with going more heavy on ipad yeah i really hope lumen fusion does the kind of work to make it impressive support because so fairy added support and you can hold down the option key and it 
turns your little tiny cursor into a huge selection cursor instead. And I think Luma Fusion could do similar things where they modify our keys to turn that trackpad into really powerful editing tools. Yeah. I also, you know, at the same time, I think Apple could release you know, Final Cut for an iPad. It might be, <laughs> might be just as well. That would be nice. Um, but yeah, that was you know, that was something that I was begging for the other day on Twitter. Is like my workflow is Final Cut when it comes to video editing, and I know how to edit quickly in Final Cut. I know how to manage my media in Final Cut. Just give it to me on the iPad. Now, that you, like you've literally got a iPad OS running laptop, right? Just like a MacBook, but iPad OS. Like now, make the iPad OS version of Final Cut, and we can rock and roll, right? Yeah, the one thing I miss from Luma Fusion that Final Cut Pro 10 did is their multi-cam editing interface. Like, nothing beats that. It's just yep. so great. Yep. So, do you still use your old smart keyboard folio ever? Like, does that fabric cover? Are there certain situations where you swap that on? Um, I haven't since getting this. A big part of that is because the 10.5 still exists in my house. So it, when I really want like a like carry it around iPad and I I'm too afraid to walk around with yeah. this giant pane of glass, <laughs> I'll just grab that one out and use that. Truthfully, like I never loved the smart keyboard or smart keyboard folio keys. Okay, yeah, like like they were they, they were fine, right? Like it wasn't like it was a, a keyboard I couldn't type on. I've I actually reviewed for another thing. I've reviewed a keyboard that like I physically couldn't use. Yeah, whenever I tried modern apple laptops the butterfly ones at least i felt like i i just couldn't type on those things because they the keys were so close together and mushy and at least the like the smart keyboards those actually felt really good for dramatically different from the max and right like they, they had decent spacing between the keys they had what felt like decent travel they weren't even uncomfortable to type on it was just one of those like and like I've said this more than once across you know different videos and stuff. Like it always reminded me of bubble wrap a little bit. Yeah, right. Like kind of like typing on a sheet of bubble wrap, which again like not bad, but not great. Right. Whereas like with with the new Magic Keyboard, I I legitimately love this keyboard. Yeah, it feels so great. My work computer is a 13 inch MacBook Pro 20, I don't know 2014 or something 2013 2014 pre butterfly keyboard. And this reminds me a lot of typing on that, right? It's like super comfortable. Like the keys have good response. They have a nice like clickety click sound, uh, but it's also not obnoxious like a mechanical keyboard. Yeah. Whereas like my my twelve inch MacBook, like I love hate the keyboard. I guess <laughs> like I like I liked it super thin, right? Mm-hmm. Because that was like the whole incentive behind that computer. Right. I cannot type like a full article or a full script or like spend all day coding on that because it's just doesn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I compared, I have an 11 inch from 2011 uh, MacBook Air, and I was surprised just after getting the Magic Keyboard how mushy that old laptop felt because that was the keyboard that I've always loved. And now right. it, it, it is more mushy than, than that one is. I, I would be curious if a brand new one out of the box felt as mushy as one that's got nine years of use <laughs> right. and abuse. Possibly like, is it yeah, is know. it legitimately the same? Yeah, I don't know. That that's kind of curious. To I'd be interested to to try a brand new 2011 MacBook Air, in 2020. Uh, yeah, because y- your MacBook is probably similar keyboard design, right? I forget if the Airs were much different from the Pros back then. My 13 and the 11 inch Air, I believe, were basically the same keyboard or a very similar keyboard. Um, they were the the old style pre butterfly post silver cap keys. Yeah, and the trackpad you couldn't click at the top either. I, I noticed that right away. It's like, oh, I, I can actually click anywhere on this trackpad. So the trackpad is actually feels better. It's a little smaller, but it feels better. I hear that. I keep hearing people talk about like you can't click at the top, and I don't remember ever running into that with my MacBook, with any of my MacBooks actually. Where you would tap to clicker though. But right, but I have tap to click, so maybe that was why I never noticed, and I just yeah, I'm remembering back to my first. Apple laptop, the 17-inch MacBook Pro uh, from 2007. And those had a uh, physical button on the very bottom, I'm remembering now. Yep, I had one of those in college. Yeah, but um, yeah. So one of the things that struck everyone about this reveal was the floating design. That's one of the things that I first saw. It's like iPads aren't especially light. I mean, they're like a pound and a half or whatever it is. And it's floating. This is wild and Amazing. Yes. So after living with this design for a couple of weeks now, any thoughts on this on the floating design and if it's still as impressive as it was back then? It's definitely still as impressive. I still think that for what it is, I would love to see Apple make a legitimate iPad OS laptop. Like an iBook. 
but right, like, like an iBook, exactly. And they've used that name <laughs> before and it name, could yeah. come back. Right, it was a perfect name for it. Because I, I do still like, and I, I talked about this in my Magic Keyboard review, like I work on my whatever device in my lap a lot, like sitting on the couch or sitting in, in a chair or whatever, like we watching TV and also working. And that because of the weight of the iPad itself, it does have a tendency to still want to tip back. And I don't remember having that issue with the smart keyboard folio. Okay. I could be wrong. Maybe I did and I just got used to it. And maybe it's just like the way I'm using this one is a little different. Or it could just be the physical size and space of I'm just kind of like looking at this from the side, like trying to figure out like, does it sit forward more or back more? But th- that's that's been my biggest thing is like the floating design is super cool, but I feel like it just back weights it a little bit more, which makes it a little more tippy. It also lets you take it off easy. Yes, for sure. Because if you didn't have the floating design, it'd be flush with the back, right? Yeah. Exactly. But again, if it was literally just an iPad OS laptop, I wouldn't necessarily need to take it apart. Uh, and then the ba- the base could be heavy because that'd be there where the battery and all the brains are. Yeah. Uh, I still think it looks amazing. And like it's at some point in time in the future, hopefully maybe I'll get to go out in public again. And at that point, like being able to use the iPad, like at a coffee shop or at work in a meeting, like, you know, that people are going to look at it and go Is that floating <laughs> and like, like something about like, it just, it feels super futuristic, which I think is part of what I like about it because of it. It actually puts the icons in your dock. Like when you're just on your home screen, it puts them kind of at the perfect spot because you're not going to accidentally bump them as you're typing or, you know, if you're punching right. through the number number row or whatever, but they're also not so far away that you can't get to them, right? So it's kind of like the perfect blend between being able to access them without being in the way. Uh, so I, I definitely like it. And, and I also think, you know, I saw a lot of griping online about the viewing angles. I don't have an issue. Like maybe the 11 inches is not as good just because size and physics, but with the 12, nine, like I can tip the sucker way back. Yeah. And um, the negative angles impress me the most. The ones where it's like on its tipping way to forward a little tipping bit forward when you're in bed and watching a video and you can just tip it forward. It doesn't fall on your face. I will say that's that is one place that everybody talks about using their iPad that I just don't. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I use the mini if I'm in bed. Like that first generation mini still sits in my bedside table. Like I just use it for iBooks. And like if I'm going to look at Twitter or anything like that, I'm going to do it on my phone. But like I don't, I don't watch Netflix or YouTube in bed. Yeah. I try not to. Right. Like. Not that I'm morally opposed to it or anything. I just don't. <laughs> just not not where I watch TV usually. I usually watch TV on like a big TV and then I go to bed when I'm falling asleep on the couch. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find yourself yanking it off the Magic Keyboard to switch modes of I'm going to be in tablet mode, now I need to type something and kind of go back and forth? Again, it's it's so hard to say like because the circumstances right now, like most of what I'm doing is just sitting at a desk. And again, I have TVs available all the time. Yeah. But like the time... Ty- like, kitchen you know i talked about using it for the recipe manager like i pop it off and then i go put it on my stand in the kitchen and then i come back and dock it later so i mean, i i'm not like yanking it i, I think that <laughs> you know the way the way i've been doing it is basically like prop it open like it's you know like you're going to use it to type on and then kind of just put your fingers in that little gap and just pull a little bit and it pops right off like, you yeah. don't have to like right tug on it too hard um and it's it's one of those like i'm always impressed with apple's like genius approach to engineering i guess because it's super sturdy like you could have this thing upside down and won't fall off but if you want it to come off it exactly will come off. right like it's it's one of those like you talk about apple design and you sound like the most ridiculous fanboy ever but like this is really good like it's it's the precise number of magnets and when you see those like little magnet papers on it and it's like oh there's like two tiny little magnets right here it's like somebody had to go in and go, we need this much more magnetic force. We need like just one more little magnet right there and one more little magnet right there. And now it's perfect. And you know, somebody spent the time to figure out like if you flip it and shake it and do whatever with it, it's not going anywhere. But when you want it to come off, pop, it's right off. Yeah. And I'm wondering the 2018 iPad, if they had prototypes of this back then, knowing this is what they wanted to create one day. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's... I mean, Again, 2018 versus 2020 iPad, like what kind of difference are we really talking <laughs> from? I, I haven't tried the 2020 iPad uh, because I don't think there's any reason to get one if you had a 2018. Agreed. Yep. Um, unless you were really looking to like change size or storage, or get capacity, cellu- or- or storage capacity or get cellular when you only had Wi-Fi. Pro tip. Because the one terabytes were a lot cheaper this time around. Right. Pro tip. Always get cellular. Yep. Doesn't matter if you're going to use it. Always get cellular. Yep. It is very handy to have, especially if your internet goes out. Oh, well, let's just sign up for cellular for this month. Getting the 2020 versus 2018, I don't think it made a difference. But I imagine just based on the fact that this is using this like crazy magnetic design, the 2018 model didn't need that crazy magnetic design. But it had it anyways. But it had it anyway, right? They could have come up with some other solution. They could have kept the 
the uh, smart connector on the side, just like every iPad before it, just like the Apple Pencil charger. Yeah. But instead, they chose to do this magnets with the smart connector on the back. And then now, you know, a year and a half, whatever, later, new model, crazy thing that also uses those same magnets. Yeah. It's interesting to see the magnet evolution from the iPad 2 and that feeling like magic of the original smart cover and just seeing Apple play with magnets with the you know the apple pencil too and how that works and they're just having fun with magnets with the ipad and it's very really cool to see their invention with this and i mean and you can even go back further than that you go back into the old macbooks and stuff like that used magnets to hold shut like the lid of your mac macbook that's has right. a magnet that's like precisely tuned amount of magnetism so that you can pop it open with one finger while the base stays on the desk but it's also enough to keep it shut when it's in your bag that's right i remember back in college having a magnet and just playing around with you could turn your laptop to sleep by putting a magnet right at the right spot i, I was almost going to do that with my laptop and then i just remembered that uh that would uh botch this <laughs> recording so <laughs> yes. you're welcome yeah i wonder I, i'm sure apple watch bands don't trigger that ever i've never had it do it okay yeah uh i have like the leather loop one and i've never had it right try to do yeah it's my favorite band the apple pencil is something you mentioned your review is not really playing nice with the magic keyboard and i'm wondering what it is for you um i mean so this is one of those cases where like the viewing angle of the ipad like could be more right if you could tip it back if you could tip the ipad back more into like a steeper angle you know closer to flat on a desk than yeah. upright i think it would work with the pencil better but like trying to like do anything other than maybe quickly like tap around the ui with the apple pencil just feels out of place right yeah you have to take it off and if you're gonna do drawing but if you're anything outside of ui navigation right and 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 now it's just dawning on me that like easels are a thing that people use totally and that maybe actually that isn't a bad angle and that it's just that maybe i need to change the surface that i'm setting the ipad on and that it would be more comfortable for drawing it's definitely not convenient for like writing notes right like that's a super awkward angle to write notes at which right. is why anybody who's ever seen somebody like write on a chalkboard or the like flip sheets of like presentation paper they, their handwriting always sucks right because like it's a weird angle to write at yeah which you can just place the ipad on top of a closed magic keyboard but again it's less than ideal i'd say right and like and, and that's my big thing is like i don't want to take the ipad out of the keyboard case just to use the ipad right where i'm sitting at the keyboard case right which is why like the smart keyboard was always really good like, that was like yes it was weird that you could feel the keys on the back but i could flip it around backwards not have to take it off not have to leave the carcass of a keyboard somewhere while i walk around somewhere else to like draw pictures or take notes in a meeting yeah but at the same time i don't know i, th I think that the people who really wanted a trackpad are probably either people who were only really using the pencil to navigate the ui which they can now do on the trackpad or people who weren't using the pencil at all right yeah. So I, I really think it's... And when I'm doing serious pencil stuff, uh, say with Ferry doing editing there with the pencil, I'll just hold the iPad in my hand and use it that way. Like, But sure. Yeah. And, and like that, that's another you know example of where like LumaFusion for me, when I've done editing, I've always used the pencil. And using the pencil for editing in LumaFusion was like kind of the, the, it was the ideal device or ideal tool for it. Because you know, your big meaty finger is not exactly great at precision cuts. But a pencil you can be a lot more accurate with. But if I can do that with the trackpad, like I don't really need the pencil to do that stuff. So is the pencil really a necessity? Yeah, it's more just like your mind might enjoy the change of modality of just using sure. the pencil and trackpad than touch, like or I don't know, or RSI issues. You can just swap. To, Absolutely, what you're I, that day. See, I think it's you know my take on it in the review was very much like how I use my device, which I think is like, that's the most fair way to do it. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. When I use the pencil, it's for navigating the UI more than anything else. Probably the second most thing, it'd be like marking up a document and then drawing and like coloring with my daughter and procreate and stuff like that, like are lower down the list. Mm -hmm. But for that kind of stuff, I'm fine taking it off of this, off of the case or out of the case and using it. But for the little like quick interactions with the pencil, I think that it's, it's less than ideal and the trackpad does a better job. Yeah. In your review, you had some other frustrations. Have those grown or lessened over time as you've spent more time with it? The, the rigidity of the hinge was was one of the things that I had said. And that's really only opening it. Yeah. Right? Everything after it's open is totally fine. Like, in fact, it's like, I love adjusting the angle of this the same as I do adjusting the angle of a MacBook. Like, it's, it's not hard. It's not inconvenient. But opening it up is kind of a pain, right? Like, when it's closed, again, magnets, man. You got, you got to overcome those magnets. Yeah, and uh, it's comforting that it's comforting in a bag at least that nothing's going to get in there. <laughs> right, for sure. 
but just the fact that, you know, and we talked about it before, like I can set my MacBook down on my desk and with one finger I can lift the lid. Right, because that screen is so light. The base stays on the desk and the screen lifts up. With the iPad, like you can do that, but upside down, right? So the iPad's on the desk and you lift the keyboard up. You yeah. can basically do that with with one hand, I th- at least I'm pretty sure. Let's try it right now. Here we go. Yeah. So I can take one finger and I can lift the keyboard, right. but the iPad's now on the desk the, and the keyboard's flip floating it. and then I got to flip the whole thing around. Yeah. Or, or I end up, you know, I set the iPad kind of on the spine, if you will, mm-hmm. and I kind of pull down and as I'm pulling down, you know, down and back to, to open it up, which isn't, it's not like, I mean, it's the first world, the first world, the is the first world problems, right? Yeah. Like, oh, it takes me an extra half a second to open my <laughs> $1,200 iPad computer. <laughs> Like okay, <laughs> I should be I shouldn't be complaining, but it is one of those things that like it's just a little bit frustrating. Yeah. Uh, but again, you know, go back to what I said very early on in this. Like the whole keyboard experience and trackpad experience and everything was something bolted onto what makes an iPad an iPad, right? A pane of glass that's touch screen that's super powerful that connects you to all this other stuff. So it wasn't purpose built to have a keyboard and trackpad. It was purpose built to be a tablet. Right. And this is just another mode that you can put it in. And then everything else is... Right. So if I have to pay a slight inconvenience charge for having a keyboard and trackpad with my $1,000 touch device, like, okay. It's kind of like... And the weight was another thing, you know, I, I had mentioned in the video that for me, I didn't see it as a big deal because if I'm going to use this as a laptop, it can weigh as much as a laptop. If I'm going to use it as a tablet, I don't want to delay it weigh as much as a laptop. And the fact that your only way to really use this as a tablet is to ditch the heavy laptop part actually makes that even better than the magic or the uh, smart keyboard folio, right? Because smart keyboard folio, you'd flip it around, but you're always carrying this big, hunky, heavy thing. Right. And you never get to enjoy the just naked (laughs) iPad experience. Exactly. Whereas this, it's like, put it down, pick up the iPad, and I can can now have this super lightweight piece of glass. Like, I forget how crazy thin and lightweight this thing is until I pull it off of there. Because basically, since I've had it, I've had some type of keyboard case attached to it almost all the time and one of the things i didn't mention is just video calls with this magic keyboard are just so much better because of the fine tuning adjustments it's just it's so great that you can like make it perfect for that well 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 the camera should be on the top as we all know <laughs> the, but the sadly, that's not the case i uh that's i i consistently have that that dilemma when I'm going to do a video call, I'm like, what device do I use for this? Because if I do the laptop... Because the Mac cameras like, all suck. <laughs> right, the Mac, the Mac cameras are all garbage. Like, even the, what, $5,000 iMac Pro is the same garbage camera as every other you know, cheap computer. And then, of course, I have my 12-inch MacBook with its 480p potato on the front of it. Oh, I forgot that was like, even worse than the standards. So it's well, it's awful, yeah. man. It's it's not it's not even... Oh, gosh. Not even half HD. It's garbage. <laughs> no, so, like, I'm always, like, going for my iPad and... So for video calls, I almost always grab the 10.5 because it's a little less dramatic yeah. than, the, than the big one. But if I'm doing like a video call for work or something and I don't need to be on camera the whole time, I might use this. It's a shame with the 2020 mile that didn't just like move the cameras up top. And well, you know, the thing I've, I had said, I think maybe I didn't in the review of the 2018 was why didn't they put the camera and all the sensors in a corner? In fact, put it in, I guess when it would be in, when it would be in the keyboard dock, it would be the top right corner, right next to the volume and power buttons, because then it's at the top, so it's a little bit more at the appropriate eye level. It would still be okay in portrait, but also okay in landscape, and I'm sure symmetry is the only reason they didn't. Right. That that because if you if you put it too far at the bottom, then you run into the issue of like those Lenovo Lenovo uh, laptops where the key the camera was actually like in the keyboard and you're like, yeah. oh, shooting up your nose so you want you want to get it higher up so if they moved it up into that corner or i guess they could have done the bottom corner also which when it's in landscape end up being the top corners would at least elevate it which makes it look a little less weird even if you're kind of off center yeah and i wonder what the apple pencil thing up there if there's any is there room up there with the apple pencil charger if it was in the top middle i don't know yeah i'm sure some engineer has some good some good reason for it again yeah if they just answer if they just made an ipad os powered laptop none of this would have to be a problem (laughs) yeah so do you find yourself using that charging port on the magic keyboard often i don't think i've used the charging port in the ipad itself since i got the keyboard i almost exclusively have now i'm using the one in the the tube on the keyboard yeah and it's kind of nice being out of the way it's kind of you don't kind of free it's plugged in even because it's just like visually behind the ipad right well like a lot of times i'll take mine i have a USB C cord that runs up 
like snakes along the edge of a chair, like a big cozy chair. Yeah. And so I'll just plug the iPad in and kind of shove it into the space between the seat and the cushion on the side and just like kind of dock it there when I'm not using it. Mm -hmm. And then whenever I need it, then it's just right there in the chair or the couch, wherever I am. And I'll pull it back out and having it in the corner. helps me like tuck it back a little bit more out of the way. And I'm not as worried. I'm going to like snap it, snap it and break the USB-C thing off inside. I still don't love the center. I, I, again, I understand Apple's obsession with symmetry and whatever, but I don't love the placement of the charging port on the iPads just in general. Just in the middle where it is, yeah. Just centered. Like I, again, I get it back when it was a portrait device that you used only in your hands, but nobody uses an iPad like that anymore. No. That's not true. Somebody does, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I like it from the perspective that you can have these kind of big docks that are attached to the iPad, and those can be cool products. I'm not sure if those would work well if it was too high or too low. Yeah. Um, so after using the Magic Keyboard more, past writing the review, anything else kind of crop up in your experience that you didn't weren't able to include in that review? Um, nothing specific that has like really jumped out at me. Um, I now I one thing I didn't talk about in the review at all was the backlighting on the keyboard because <laughs> it didn't even dawn on me that that was new. Right. Uh, but but again, like because I bounce so much between a MacBook of some capacity and an iPad, it just kind of felt in place. It felt natural. And I, I rarely adjust the backlighting on my keyboard on my computers as it is. So like, I never even thought about the fact that like, Oh, to adjust the backlighting on the trackpad or the keyboard on the magic keyboard, you have to like go into settings. So what is it? Settings, general keyboard, hardware keyboard, keyboard brightness. Like, yeah, it's a lot. That, that's a lot of steps, but you know what? This is the first time I've been there since I got this thing. <laughs> <laughs> just just now as i'm talking to you so it's it's not even something that like i think about you know a lot of people are like oh i want dedicated like volume buttons or, or dedicated uh screen brightness buttons well you know there is a dedicated volume button it's literally the side of the ipad <laughs> like there there that's one of the only buttons the ipad has like it has had dedicated volume buttons since day one they got rid of that lock switch button sadly yeah yeah and like i use i use auto brightness on pretty much all of my devices so i I rarely mess with the screen brightness. And if I do, like I've never been so inconvenienced that I can't just like pull down control center and do it. And you can even swipe with two fingers on the trackpad, which is nice. Really? Holy cow, you can. <laughs> Volume Learn control Learn something as well. new. Yep. Wow, that's awesome. I haven't found like new gripes about it. I still love it just as much as I did initially, which is a good sign. Like I'm not all of a sudden like wanting to return it. Yeah, that's that's something that has happened with, with other things in the past. Some of it's just, you know, I can't. I can't keep every device that comes into my life, but I have a lot of things where I'm like, I got it. I was like super excited about it. Like HomePod. I got one of those. I tried it out and I was like, "Mm, this is cool, but like, it's just a really nice speaker and I have like a hundred other speakers in the house. So I don't need this. And like phones, right? Like get the new phone. I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. And then after like two weeks, I'm like, all right, this iPhone 11 pro is basically the same as my 10 was. And like, yeah, the cameras are great and stuff, but yeah, it doesn't really feel different. Whereas with this, like every time I pull it out, I'm like, this is my new laptop. Right. And like, it still feels like my new laptop. And then I like have to get out my 12 inch MacBook today. And I'm like, Oh, poor little dude. When this was initially revealed, did you think it'd be the same material as the other smart keyboard? Like, did you think it would be metal? Like I kind of wasn't sure what it would be made of. I think what I had in my mind, like prior to actually physically having it was basically the magic key or the smart keyboard folio. Jeez, I can't keep his name straight anymore. The uh, smart keyboard folio, but with a trackpad on it. Yeah. Like I thought it would just be like a cutout where you had a piece of glass in the middle of like this all fabric-y thing. But then as I started thinking about it, I was like, they're putting this magic keyboard, whatever, in all of their things now. So maybe it's not going to be the same, but I thought maybe it would still be fabric covered because the iPad is kind of a take it everywhere device right. more so than a Mac would be. I didn't think a ton about the materials. I I will say I like whatever this material is. Yeah, it's got a nice tactile feel to it. Like it's not cold like a metal would be and since it's not a laptop at the bottom it wouldn't heat up to make it less cold <laughs> exactly I, I like that I, I i am still concerned about the the keys i don't think we've seen the magic keyboard in their laptops long enough to know if it's truly a fix we know their scissor switches though again right yeah, which is but, good but you know all of all of the concern aside like again i'm using a 2015 macbook with the butterfly keyboards so i'm on like five years of this and i haven't had any keys fail or double key presses or anything weird like that but i use this laptop almost exclusively for like video editing yeah and photo editing like which are very trackpad driven at least for me very trackpad driven and like keyboard shortcuts because if i'm going to do any long form writing i'm doing that on an ipad so again like 
different devices for different tasks has maybe helped my MacBook not fail where it could have if I was using it for everything. Right. I certainly hope at you know 300 or 350 bucks the keyboard and the Magic Keyboard lasts quite a while. Yeah. I, I will be getting Apple Care monthly or whatever on this iPad that I got about a month ago. And does that cover the keyboard then too? It covers the keyboard and the Apple Pencil, which is nice. it seems great. It's like let's cover all the accessories. Yeah. It's uh that makes it a little more worth it, I guess. Yeah, if it was just the iPad it'd be less worth it. But yeah, having the keyboard covered too, which is probably the one of the things I would I had the older smart keyboard replaced for the second gen iPad Pro a couple times. There sure. were some reliability issues, not with the keys, but that smart connector and that thing would get get beat up rather easily. Maybe I'm an anomaly. Like most of my devices don't seem to have an issue like getting too banged up or falling apart or anything like that. Yeah. Like I see a lot of people they're like, God, my smart keyboard like is all like torn apart and the letters are all worn <laughs> off and this is all scratched up and flaking up and peeling up and or I look at people's laptops and like, you know, the aluminum is all like have a space gray or a gold one and the aluminum is just like down to totally silver in a bunch of spots i'm like what's on your hands like why why does your device look like that so maybe i'm i'm an anomaly and i'm just more gentle with my stuff yeah the only thing that gets really banged up for me is my iphone se which i don't have in a case and i just like no. it's fine it's just gonna get beat up that's, that's fine that's character right that's character yeah yeah but uh yeah anything else before we wrap it up the big thing for me is just like i definitely think you need to know what kind of ipad user you are whether you decide whether this is something for you right? like, i don't i don't think everybody needs the key- magic keyboard like it as you said it changes everything all over again it's a brand new form factor for the ipad like the smart keyboard right. was one new form factor this is yet another yeah and i think i think for for a non-trivial number of people the iPad is still very much a touch device, right? Something they carry in their hands and they interact almost exclusively with their fingers. Like you probably don't need the magic keyboard. You probably don't even need the uh, smart keyboard folio like you can, or a smart keyboard for older ones or whatever. You can probably get by like with just a nice protective case if, it, if it's something you're worried about. I think that a lot of people got really excited about this and they're like, oh, it's a new laptop. But then you also, you have the people on the other side that are like, it's not a Mac, like, stop it. <laughs> and like I think there's a totally justified case for using whatever device for whatever thing. Like I I do a ton of work on my phone. Like that's not right. a Mac either. But yeah. nobody's given me hell about using my phone to respond to emails or look up stuff or you know what I I even logged into servers from my phone if if it's what I have with me and I need to fix something. Like nobody nobody seems to complain about the device when it's a phone. So I don't know why people complain about the iPad. But I think that. The iPad is just as much a computer option for a lot of people. And the cool thing about it is that you can kind of build it to be the computer you want it to be yeah. for what you need it to be. Like, So if you want something you can sit and hold and watch movies on and surf the web on, it can be that. If you want something you can type a book on, it can be that. If you want something you can draw on, it can be that. If you want something you can record a podcast on, like I guess you got to get a Mac. But otherwise, like it can do just about anything you need. Yeah. So um, where can people find your fantastic review and your other work? The reviews at cultofmac.com. I'm on the internet at Ian Fuchs on Twitter. And from there, you can find pretty much anything else that I do. Not on Facebook, not on Instagram. <laughs> well, I am on Instagram, but my Instagram, Instagram is long <laughs> abandoned at this point. Yeah, that's like my Instagram is like, oh, here's pictures from two years ago. Yeah, here's my so. historical instagram uh, well thank you so much ian for your time it's been great chatting with you and learning more about how you use the ipad and your magic keyboard review yeah thanks tim well that was my interview with ian all about the magic keyboard check out ian's review over on the cult of mac big skin to ian for his time recording and thanks to you for your time tuning in as a reminder head over to patreon.com slash ipad pros to support this podcast with that thanks for listening and i'll talk to everyone again next week for another episode of ipad pros